PFAS or per and fluoroalkyl substances were pioneered by DuPont in the 1950s and were created to give us these non-stick surfaces we know from Teflon pans and uh, linings of popcorn bags and so on. Now they're also called forever chemicals and the reason for that is that they kind of last forever. They do not biodegrade. So just like diamonds they're going to stick around. Not as desirable but, but we have them. Now it's estimated that since the 1950s to about 2013 DuPont produced about 800 tons of them and certainly there's other industries that produced them as well. So the issue with these PFAS is that you know these uh, substances like PFOA and PFOS and we know these from Teflon. PFOA has been banned. That is one of the um, substances, one of the PFAS that we've identified uh, because it is very toxic as all of them are but this is one that has been studied more. So when you look at your new Teflon pan now, it'll probably say PFOA free. Doesn't mean that the other ones are not in there and they certainly will be because if it's a non-stick surface that's created with these sort of artificial plastics, if you want, I mean, that's what they use, you know? And um, so you can't get, you know, the non-stick surface really in creating it this way without having some of them in there. I mean, just because one of them is banned doesn't mean the rest is not in there. and you know, they're probably just as bad and some might be worse. So these substances, again, uh, many, many tons of these were produced. And the issue we have right now is that they're everywhere. They're in the air, they're in the water, they're in plants now, they're in humans, you know, we absorb them. And the problem is that they are carcinogenic. So they are cancer causing, you know, they cause a lot of problems. Um, so soil, water, air, plants, animals, they're present in all of these. Um, again, used in non-stick cookware, fast food wrappers, stain resistant fabrics, microwave popcorn bags, cosmetics, and so on. And again, again they've been present for quite some time. And these materials, uh, besides leaking possibly into the food we consume from them, you know, although I think that might actually be a bit less of a concern, you know, when you look at a Teflon pan, you know, you really have to heat it to about five, 600 degrees Fahrenheit before some of the substances you know, come out and they're gonna be in your food. And in general, we don't really heat food quite that hot. Now, that's not, that's not to say that none of them go in, but I mean, I think the amount going in there with an intact Teflon pan that you don't heat so much is probably not as high. However, due to the production of these, I mean, there's a lot of remnants and, and chemicals that are then in, in, in landfills and old Teflon pans and, and wrappers and all that they're sitting there. And from there, the stuff can then leak into the soil, you know, and into the groundwater and so on. And I think that's probably the bigger concern. Um, they're linked to liver damage, cancer, decreased fertility, asthma, and thyroid disease, amongst others. And again, they're found in uh, uh, humans and we can trace them. There are certain labs that can actually do blood tests. And in the blood test, we can see that most people will have some of these in their bloodstream at this point. Um, it is still a fairly new topic, I would say, you know, I mean, it's been around for several years that we understand this, but um, the industry has already made efforts to reduce them. Again, in Europe, they're trying to ban all of these substances, which I don't know if they'll be successful or not. In the US, in uh, Japan and, and in the European Union, we have already banned uh, PFOA, so that's banned. And when you, again, when you get your new Teflon pan, it will probably say PFOA free, but you know, keep in mind, I talked about this in plastic chemicals before, just because it says this one ingredient is not in there, there's usually a substitute. And the substitute might be just as bad or possibly worse. And uh, I talked about uh, BPA, so the bisphenols. Bisphenol A, BPA, has been kind of reduced. A lot of uh, plastic containers that we use in contact with food will say BPA free, fine. But then again, we have BPS and BPF, and arguably they can be even worse. So again, just saying that one ingredient is not in there and there are thousands of these, you know, I mean, these PFAS, there's many, many, many of them. And um, what the industry does is if one is banned, they're trying to create new ones that have not been banned. And they know these are bad, by the way. I mean, it's not like they know, uh, oh, we think this one might be better. This one, none of them are healthy. <laughs> none of them are good. All of them most likely will cause severe problems in human tissue, you know, and then animals as well, of course. So, you know, just because one is banned and then we're replacing it doesn't make it better. And actually here, uh, the issue is also that the new molecules they're replacing the old ones with might be a little bit smaller even. So they take off, you know, just a few atoms here and there and still have their nonstick, uh, you know, kind of uh, capability. But now we have a molecule that's even a bit smaller and that becomes an issue. So it might get easier absorbed. Anyway, so it's pretty scary stuff found in blood, breast milk, uh, placenta, and so on, not great. 
half-life in humans about eight years. So that means, you know, once it gets in our body, you know, uh, it takes eight years to get rid of about half of the amount that we, that we absorbed. So the good news is we do get rid of it over time. While these molecules don't degrade, again, they're called fibrochemicals, we over time can excrete them to some extent. The issue is though that we continuously absorb more. And unless we stop that, you know, I mean, it's gonna be very hard for us to excrete all of them. While they're in our body, they do cause problems. And again, the issues that I uh, talked about earlier, they're very real and they're very concerning. And it's something that, you know, need to, needs to be uh, taken very, very seriously, I believe. Um, they're very small in size and that's one of the issues how do we get them out of let's say the drinking water and that's one of the main issues i see is that their presence in the drinking water because presence in the air presence in the soil presence in plants i mean you know yes we can hopefully eating organic vegetables let's say control that a bit but you know if it's in the soil if it's if it's in the water whether it's organic or not you know these are not in pesticides that we artificially put on it's already in the ground so the plants will take it up so we cannot vet, you know, influence that too much. But what we take in in drinking water, we might be able to influence somewhat using a water filter. The bad news is a regular water filter like I have right now, a regular water filter on my sink tap, you know, will probably not take these out or take these out in only tiny amounts. And I have just now bought a better filter. It's called a reverse osmosis filter. These systems have been around for a while, but they used to use these cumbersome tanks and there were issues with bacteria building up in tanks. So there's new systems now that are tankless and I kind of like that. I'll do another video to show how that can be installed. You know, they're around $400 for the system. And then, you know, you change this filter about once a year. It's about $100 for the filter, but still this will give you a very good filtration of these substances. And, you know, the manufacturers link it in there. So PFAS are actually some of the substances that are filtered out, which I think is a very, very good thing. And why is that? So, so the particle size of these PFAS is very small, about 0 0.0005 microns, so very small. Now, a regular filter will not take that out, and it's because of the pore size of the filter to simplify this a bit. Um, activated charcoal helps a bit, so some of it will be taken out, but not all of it. So it really comes to particle size and reverse osmosis. I mean, we know osmosis is this, you think about from biology, the semi-permeable membrane and basically solutes stay on one side and then the, the water goes in and out and it goes usually to the higher concentration of solute. That's osmosis. And reverse osmosis uses this principle to um, have a, a, a very, very small pore size essentially to allow the filtering out of smaller particles and they actually then get excreted. So in a, a reverse osmosis system, will have a line that goes into the wastewater. So they're produced for each glass you filter. There's actually somewhat of the equivalent volume of a wastewater that gets discarded, right? It's a bit wasteful, but it's only for drinking water. It's not usually a lot. So again, small particles. Now, RO, reverse osmosis water filters, are highly effective because they can filter out particles that are uh, greater than 0 0.001 microns. So particles that are um, the same size or uh, uh, even a bit smaller than, uh, than those PFAS can be filtered out with a reverse osmosis filter. And I think that's actually a very good approach. Now, some people take bottled water. Again, I don't like it. And I talked about in other talks, if it's packaged in plastic, plastic bottles, even if they're BPA free, they will leak some other chemicals in there. I think that's not a great idea. It's also very cumbersome, but I think a good reverse osmosis filter will help. The other thing is they are not present in the same amount all over the country, you know. If you live close to a landfill or if there's been other issues, industry, heavy industry or industry that produces these PFAS uh, essentially, there will probably be a lot, a lot more on the groundwater. And you can go to, um, you know, look at the report, the water report of your supplier in your region. They are uh, obligated to put these reports out and they will tell you on there, you know, have we found PFAS in our drinking water? And if so, in what amounts, you know? Um, so there's an annual uh, report that gets published and it's, you know, publicly available and you can look into that. I think that's a very good start. So to see, you know, like, I mean, how much is in my water in the region where I live? I think that's an important thing to do before you make decisions on how to, how to handle it. But I think even if it's in small quantities, I mean, you know, and this is kind of where the industry always says, well, look, it's just a little bit, it's not so bad. I think that's a horrible thing to say. We know this is toxic, you know, and uh, 
I don't want even the safe amount in my body and not worry about it. I mean, I think the best thing is to say, I don't want any of it because on an individual basis, we don't know how much one person absorbs versus another and you know, uh, what sources uh, of uh, uh, these compounds one person is exposed to versus another. So this is a, a, a wide variation and there's really guesswork in the end. But it's very clear that we don't want them in our bodies and the best thing is to cut them out completely. I mean, that's an easy thing, you know, when you think about it, the less the better. All right, so again, they're making new alternative PFAS and they are smaller, which is worse, they're more mobile easier taken up by plants and they're not regulated yet. And that's kind of how the industry works. And again, gave you the example of uh, BPA. Now we have VPS, BPF, and it's the same thing here. So the industry needs these, if you have any non-stick surface from a raincoat, you know, to a wrapper that doesn't, you know, get soggy where your burger still stays kind of, kind of fresh to Teflon pans, uh, any non-stick surface really needs some of these materials. And I think the best thing is to see what alternatives can we have. In terms of, let's say, uh, frying pans, I mean, uh, most pans that are Teflon, you know, again, will have, give you some exposure. Again, I don't think it is a whole lot unless you cook at higher temperatures, but one alternative there would be, for example, ceramic, you know, they use an aluminum pan and they put a ceramic coating on there usually. Of course, when that breaks, then you're exposed to the aluminum and that, you know, gotta be careful on that. But as long as that's intact, I think a ceramic is a good alternative. These pans are fairly cheap, I mean, you know, and uh, I think it's a good investment. We bought a set of three pans of three different sizes for like uh, $58. Um, I'm estimating the last six months to a year when they get scratches, then you, re you know, replace them. But if you use that a lot, I think that's a pretty good investment. Um, you know, when you think of fast food wrappers, the fast food industry actually recognized this issue and they're trying now to get rid of them in their fast food, you know. So some of the industry is catching on to this and saying, you know what, we know this is bad now or they're saying, well, we know the public found out that this is bad and we want to kind of make some changes here to either look better or, you know, to be more environmentally friendly and, you know, have less toxins out that people absorb. IKEA is another example. So IKEA has now, I think, banned um, the use of PFAS in its entire production line because, again, they were present in some of the surfaces, some of the chemicals they used, and they said, we're going to get rid of them. And that's great. I mean, it's a bit of a marketing thing, too, but it's, you know, I'll take it. I mean, that's great. You know, if they are on their own saying, look, we're going to ban this stuff. This is really bad. We don't want to contribute further to this leaking into the groundwater. Great step in the right direction, I think. So again, the best thing to do is, you know, avoid anything that has these nonstick surfaces. Look really and do your research where it's in. Unfortunately, and I'm going to do some more talks about this, it's even in some dental floss. And that's really scary. I mean, you know, it's in things that we don't think about, but we use on a daily basis. And, um, you know, these are very, very, very toxic. So again, we need to avoid as best as we can any exposure to them. Um, and again, from the Teflon pan, if you have them, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily toss it out. Just remember, cook at temperatures that are not super hot and you can measure temperature in your pan actually with a laser thermometer. They're fairly cheap if you want to really know how hot you're cooking in your pan. Um, again, you have ceramic as an alternative. I don't know how to cook with stainless steel or with cast iron. So that's not my thing, you know, it's a bit complicated, but ceramic kind of works quite nice. And uh, so far that's been pretty good. So again, um, my biggest concern with these is the exposure through drinking water. Um, I'll do another video to show kind of this reverse osmosis uh, uh, box that I bought. It again, doesn't have a tank anymore. I think it's a pretty simple system. Fairly easy to, uh, to install under your sink and that you know, the studies have shown that that can take out, you know, over 90% of these, which is, I think, fantastic. And then changing the filter frequency. But the most important thing also will be to just check with your city to check what are the levels in your drinking water. And again, that's in the annual report. I think that's a good first step to see if it's present and then, you know, do best you can to avoid these.